So um, I want to um, finish up what I started last time kind of hurriedly at the end, uh, talking about attenuation. I'm just going to cover it fairly briefly. Um, and then move forward into eukaryotic um, uh, control of gene expression. Um, attenuation, as I noted last time, was a mechanism that cells use to sense the amount of tryptophan, and as we'll see, other amino acids that are present in cells, and so that they can adjust their uh, translation uh, of those uh, and transcription of those uh, accordingly. So if you remember that there was a scheme that we had where we had a messenger RNA that had uh, a sequence called the attenuator. And the attenuator had two possible structures in it. One possible structure was uh, what was called a, uh, an anti-terminator and one that was called a terminator. Okay? So depending upon which of these structures forms, either transcription will continue or transcription will stop as soon as the termination signal has been received. The two possible signals that can be received are either A, there's plenty of tryptophan, or B, there's very little tryptophan. And they set up very different scenarios for the ribosome that's moving down, translating this short leader peptide. So the leader peptide, I'll remind you, was a sequence that had a very short polypeptide that it coded for. As I told you, the polypeptide itself didn't do any, doesn't do anything, but it does contain within it two codons right next to each other that specify tryptophan. So that sequence is shown here in yellow. In the scenario that you see on the screen, the cell had plenty of tryptophan, and the ribosome moved across this sequence quite readily. It got up to, and it, it get, got up to at that point, the uh, anti-terminator, and it covered it up. So when it covered up the anti-terminator, the terminator itself was allowed to form, and the terminator forming caused the RNA polymerase to be kicked off and transcription to be terminated. So this is a mechanism of, of terminating transcription early. And this is important because if you remember, the operon that we're talking about here had 10 genes within it. So it's a very big commitment of a lot of energy, and the cell doesn't want to commit all that energy if it has plenty of tryptophan. So when tryptophan is abundant, transcription stops early. Okay. On the other hand, when transcription is not very abundant, what happens is the ribosome gets to those two tryptophan sequences and sits and waits for a transfer RNA containing tryptophan to come into the A site. Because it waits, there's a gap that forms between uh, uh, the ribosome and the RNA polymerase, and the uh, uh, terminator sequence does not get a chance to form. Instead, the anti-terminator forms very uh, readily, the anti-terminator stops the termination. I, I, I should say it stops termination, which means it allows the RNA polymerase to continue to move. And so when that happens, the RNA polymerase goes along its merry way and finishes synthesizing the entire operon. Okay? Now, uh, this is a simplification of the scheme. You might look at this and say, well, why doesn't that blue sequence form? And it turns out that the reason it doesn't form is it's possible for the blue sequence to form pairings with the red sequence. It's not shown on this figure. And the pairing of the blue sequence with the red sequence is actually what causes this um, non-termination event to occur. For our purposes, we look at it as either one or the other. Either the anti-terminator forms or the terminator forms, and the difference between those relates to how fast the ribosome moves. Okay. Yes, sir. Uh, I'm just curious because so when the ribosome is being picked out, yes, it still has translated something. So we have some piece of polypeptide that has to be degraded. So right. Each time it comes and nobody in cell doesn't need to prepare, it still produces some, so it weighs some yes. of the amino acids. Is it like, so it's, or it's better than just from? His observation is that, you know, this system isn't 100% efficient because it has wasted some energy in making some messenger RNA that it doesn't need and a polypeptide that it doesn't need. Okay? And this is a really good example that everybody wants there to be a perfect system. And there are no perfect systems. Okay? This is a very, very good system for sensing the amount of amino acids that's there. And the cell is willing to invest a small amount of energy into making that polypeptide and the short messenger RNA to have that sensing ability. Okay? 
So I know it's very desirable to say, well, th this isn't the best way it could possibly do it. But it turns out that it's a very, very good way for cells to do it. And remember that cells evolved this system. Okay? So they evolved this system. They didn't have somebody sitting around going, OK, well, let's do this one, let's do this one, let's do this one. This is the best way to have this thing work. Okay? It doesn't work that way. This is how the system itself evolved. Yes, sir? So you have either little tryptophan or a lot of tryptophan. That's really what you have. So if you have little tryptophan, then the operon will be made. If you have a lot of tryptophan, the operon will not be made. OK? OK. So that's attenuation. Let's turn our attention. Oh, actually, I want to show you one other thing here. So this, this phenomenon is not unique to tryptophan. In fact, cells, uh, bacterial cells, but we're, again, we're still in prokaryotes. Bacterial cells use this for several amino acid operons. Here's the tryptophan operon. I'm sorry, there's, here's the threonine operon at the top. Look how many times threonine appears in that polypeptide chain. Okay? It's also linked with isoleucine, which is on the same operon. And you can see that the abundance of these really means that if these sequences are low in abundance, then we're going to have ribosome pausing okay, considerably and allowing that anti-terminator to form and allowing the transcription to continue. Um, here's the sequence of phenylalanine uh, operon. Okay, look at all the phenylalanines in there. And here's the sequence of the uh, leader peptide for the histidine operon. So again, we see this theme carrying through several of the amino acid operons, and it's a very, very um, uh, efficient system for the cell to sense the amounts of amino acids. OK, well, I want to turn our attention to eukaryotes. We've talked about eukaryotes peripherally uh, quite a bit. And I want to spend a little bit of time talking about the uh, structure of chromosomes. Chromosomes um, are uh, eukaryotic um, uh, structures that we can see in a microscope. And the reason we can see them in a microscope is uh, because these long, long, long strands of DNA are wrapped with proteins called histones. Okay? And, in, and I said wrapped with. In fact, it's the DNA that wraps around the histones. The wrapping of DNA by histones allows for the cell to take a very, very large amount of DNA and squeeze it into a nucleus that's not much bigger than a bacterial cell. Now, that's pretty remarkable when you think about the fact that a bacterial cell has uh, a few million base pairs, and the nucleus of a eukaryotic cell has a few billion base pairs. Okay? That's a thousand-fold difference in quantity, yet they're both fitting into something that's roughly the same size. Okay? Well, we know, of course, that things can't fit into the nucleus. I've given you the statistic before that if we take all the DNA in a eukaryotic cell and stretch it end to end, it goes seven feet. And there's no way that a nucleus can contain something that's seven feet in size. So the way that cells accomplish this is with histones. And that's very good in terms of packing things in. But it's also very complicated in terms of being able to transcribe genes and also to replicate DNA. So those histones have to be managed. They have to be moved. And the sequences that are contained within the genes and so forth have to be made readily accessible. Well, let's spend a few minutes talking about what the histones themselves actually look like, or what, what, the, what the structures actually look like. Okay? All right, so um, histones themselves form complexes called nucleosomes. And nucleosomes contain eight proteins. Okay. Eight proteins, H, H2A, H2B, H3, and H4. That's what they're called. And there's two copies of each. So there's two, a, two H2As, two H2Bs, two uh, H3s, and two H4s. There's also a histone called H1. And H1 has the function not of being in this core, which is where you see the wrapping occurring, but instead, H1 is in the spaces in between the wrappings. So if we look at this picture, 
you can see a wrapped nucleosome where, where the, the cursor is. A wrapped nucleosome, a wrapped nucleosome, all right? Between there, we see little stretches, and those little stretches are threads, the DNA uh, 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 strand itself, and it's covered with H1. So H1 serves as what we call a spacer. So H1 is spacing out the individual nucleosome particles, and the minimum particle is called a core particle. Right? So a core particle is a basic structure of a nucleosome. It's the minimum structure that gives that thing that you saw on the last picture. Okay? This uh, shows the DNA in red and blue wrapping around these eight proteins, as you can see, in a core particle. And this schematically shows the same thing. And you can see, in this case, two of the yellows, two of the purples. Uh, you can't see both of the oranges, and you can't see both of the greens. But oh, actually, you can, there's a second green you can see right there. Uh, but you can't see the other orange behind this guy. OK. When we look at the individual um, histones, we discover that they have very strong structural similarity to each other. All right? The first most obvious thing we see about the histones is that they are very positively charged. They're full of lysine and arginine residues. And this turns out to be really good because the backbone of DNA is composed of phosphates, and phosphates are negatively charged. So this positive-negative interaction allows them to form a type complex, which they do. Moreover, we see that there's, because there's very little difference in the structure of these, it tells us that the structure is really, really critical for function. When we compare the sequences of amino acids within the um, histone, and these are individual histone proteins, when we compare the amino acid sequence of the individual histone proteins between yeast, which is one of the simplest eukaryotes, and human beings, which are one of the more comp complex eukaryotes, we see virtually no difference in amino acid sequence. Very, very little difference in amino acid sequence. That also reinforces the idea that this structure is critical because evolutionarily it has been conserved. And what that means is that mutations that give other structures have been selected against, and the cells that had those didn't live. Okay. All right. The, this figure is nice because it begins to give us an idea of, of the complexity of what goes into making a chromosome. Okay? We think about that chromosome as existing like what I showed on the last figure, which was, or on that, that picture that I showed you, which was the, what's called the beads on the string. Bead, string, bead, string, bead, string. But that beads on the string only happens if we pull apart the chromosomes. Okay? It doesn't exist as the chromosomes exist, and this begins to show how those individual beads actually exist inside of a cell. Okay? They are tightly wound, as you can see here. And this complex itself might be tightly wound with another complex over here. So any individual sequence of DNA that's in here is very, very difficult for enzymes to get in and use. Okay? So we have to think about, well, how does transcription occur? How does DNA replication occur? Because this is a very complicated environment. Very, very complicated environment. Okay. Well, there are um, some things I want to point out, some structures that I've sort of ignored prior to this point, but that are, are important for us to understand. Um, and they are common, what we call domains, that are found in proteins that bind to DNA. Domains in proteins that bind to DNA. What is a domain? A domain is simply a structural feature, a structural aspect of a protein. You can think of it as a structural component of a protein that is found in multiple proteins. Now again, when we see a structure that appears in multiple proteins, we know structures related to function. We think those same proteins may have similar functions, and in fact they do. In the case of DNA binding proteins, they commonly have domains that include things like what you see on the screen, a leucine zipper. What is a leucine zipper? A leucine zipper looks kind of like what you see on the screen. It has 
a region that you can see in the bottom that is fairly basic, again, meaning that it contains lysines and arginines, and is therefore fairly positively charged. That region is able to interact with the uh, major groove of the uh, double helix of DNA, as you can see here. And it actually can bind to very specific sequences as a result of hydrogen bonding uh, within that, that major groove. The rest of the structure of the protein, and there's more to the protein than this, but another component of the, this domain is the actual zipper. Why do we call it a zipper? Well, the reason we call it a zipper is if the way that this got discovered was people started um, isolating and determining the sequence of the coding region of transcription factors, proteins that bound to DNA. And when they did that, some of them had this very interesting and what seemed at the time like an odd feature. The odd feature was that they would have regions of uh, sequence within themselves that had a leucine appearing every seven residues. Every seven residues. And so they thought, well, it wasn't a coincidence that it was appearing every seven residues, but why is it appearing every seven residues? And it turned out that you always had, where you had it in one, one strand, you always had it in another part of the same protein. And it turned out that what happened is if you go every seven residues, that there's an inward pointing R group, and that R group of a leucine, uh, of, of, a, um, of a lysine, I keep saying leucine, the, the R group of a, of, of a, of a lysine, I'm, I'm sorry, it's not a lysine, it's a leucine, no, <laughs> no I've really got a screw. The R group of the leucine is on the inside part, and the R group of leucine is nonpolar. So these nonpolar R, R groups, every seven residues, are interacting with each other. One from the yellow, one from the orange, one from the yellow, one from the orange. And very much like the, the, the tines of a zipper, they're sort of interacting like this. Well, what that does is it helps to hold those two strands together. It's an example of hydrophobic interactions that are helping to stabilize the protein structure. And because these are held together, as you see on the top, this bottom part is able to bind to DNA. So the leucine zipper structure is a very useful structure for a DNA binding protein. Another structure that we see in DNA binding proteins is known as a zinc finger. And the zinc finger derives its name from the fact that it's, again, it's a domain, it's a part of a protein, and it's a part of a protein that's binding to DNA. The zinc finger actually has a structure that looks like a finger, and that finger sticks into, again, the major groove of DNA, and it's reading the bases. It knows where, which bases to bind to. The finger structure arises from the fact that there's a turn that you see that arises like this. This is a turn in the sequence. This is actually the finger right there. There's the tip of it right there. And within that finger is a zinc that is held in place by the side chains of cysteines and histidines. So zinc fingers have a zinc in the very, very much near their tip that helps the finger itself to form. And as I said, that finger sticks into the major groove and binds to it. Okay, so that's what a zinc finger looks like. So these are two domains that we commonly see in DNA binding proteins. When we get talking about transcription and eukaryotes, there are a lot of DNA binding proteins, as I've alluded to before, and it's one of the reasons for bringing up these structural motifs uh, at this time. One of the DNA binding proteins um, that uh, we see uh, here in red can interact with a protein called mediator. And mediator is a protein that itself doesn't bind to DNA, but it mediates interactions between a transcription factor and an RNA polymerase. In fact, mediator is a protein that very commonly mediates interactions between these two. Well, why do you need to have something like this? Well, if you remember in eukaryotic systems, the sequences for transcription factors can be very far away from the transcriptional start site. This allows the DNA to bend, for example, and bring these sequences into close proximity where this now holds them together and allows transcription to get started. So in the case of eukaryotes, we don't have to have the transcriptional control promoter sequences immediately next to 
the place where transcription starts. In the prokaryotes, we saw a minus 10 sequence. That's not very far from where transcription starts. In eukaryotic sequences, we can see promoters easily extending two or 300 base pairs away. And in some cases, we can see the sequence is extending several thousand base pairs away if we're talking about enhancers. OK, so the mediator helps facilitate the interaction of the transcription factors that are bound to the DNA and the RNA polymerase, which is bound to the transcriptional start site. Questions about that? Mediator is a, uh, actually, that's a good question. I think I, mediator, I believe, and that's what they're de designating here, is a multi subunit protein. Yeah. This whole thing can be actually quite a large complex. There'd be a lot of things that are all bound together to make that transcription uh, occur. OK. Um, enhancers, um, as I mentioned uh, before, are sequences that affect transcription in eukaryotic cells. We don't really see the equivalent of, tra of enhancers in prokaryotes, although some people call some sequences enhancers. They're not really the same as what we see in eukaryotic cells. I'll remind you that an enhancer sequence which is an enhancer sequence element, which is another term for it, is found in eukaryotic cells. And as I said, it affects transcription. And it affects it in a tissue-specific way. So an enhancer sequence that works in a skin cell may not work in a bone cell. Well, how is it that the same sequence, which is present in both of those cells, affects one cell but not the other cell? The answer is that there is a protein that recognizes the enhancer sequence that is only found in one of those cells, but not the other cell. So it's actually the proteins binding to the enhancers that determine the function of that enhancer. Okay? No protein, no transcription. If there's a protein, we can have transcription. This shows the, uh, a start set of a gene, and it shows various enhancers that are present, in this case, probably several thousand base pairs away from the transcriptional start site, as I noted in the mediator uh, slide. Okay? It's not uncommon for us to see enhancer sequences appearing multiple times. Multiple enhancers allows more opportunities for enhancer proteins to bind to those sequence elements. Okay? Not uncommon to see this at all. Now, here is, let's imagine, if you will, that I've got an, uh, uh, a gene that's needed in, let's say, bone and skin cells. All right? All right? Might be needed in bone and skin cells. But the bone cell doesn't recognize the same enhancer that the skin cell recognizes. Let's say the skin cell recognizes the one in the red, the bone cell recognizes the one in the blue. Okay? How does transcription happen? All right? Well, if the bone cell is making this enhancer, and the skin cell is the protein that recognizes this enhancer sequence, and the skin cell is making an enhance a protein that recognizes this enhancer sequence, then they both can trend they both can express the gene. This element might be found. Let's say, why do they make different proteins? Isn't that inefficient? No, it's very efficient because this enhancer sequence might be found on some other gene that's not needed by skin cells. Yes. How can you make a specific protein in one cell and not a specific protein in another cell? In other words, his question is, aren't you just taking the problem one step further away? Well, the answer is yes, to some extent. We are making the problem go one step further away. Your question is, how does that happen? And the way that that happens is, during the process of development, cells hierarchically express classes of proteins. And it's those classes of proteins that are expressed that determine which transcription factors will be made inside of that cell. Okay. So if I'm a bone cell, I'm going to make a class of transcription factors that are going to be different from the class that's made in a skin cell. Okay? So therefore, um, everything that happens after that developmental uh, differentiation has happened is going to determine now which proteins I'm going to make. Does that answer your question? Yes. 
sort of. Okay, yes, back there. Will transcription start, 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 start sites that have an enhancer region also have a separate promoter region? And the answer is yes, they will. Yep. Now, that, that promoter region is usually by itself not sufficient in order to drive the transcription. The enhancer sequence really, really makes that transcription much more likely and much more efficient. Yes? Could you say the first part of your thing again? Yeah. So in the absence of the enhancer, it's going to be very inefficient in terms of binding. It might be completely turned off. That's right. Did you say that one enhancer sequence and one type of cell will be recognized for a certain protein and then recognized for a different protein? So his question is, um, I think, will this be recognized by one protein in one cell and by another protein in another cell? No. This will be recognized by one protein. This will be recognized by a different protein. This will be recognized by a different protein. But generally, you'll only have one protein that's going to recognize one sequence. OK. So now, as we will see with enhancers, there's a reason uh, that enhancers actually um, um, are important. Uh, and I'll show you that when I get later talking about uh, the remodeling of chromatin that happens. And by the way, chromatin, when you hear the term chromatin, I should point out, chromatin simply refers to that complex of DNA and protein. So we can think of chromatin as the result of all of the nucleosomes being put together. Okay. So chromosome is the product of all the nucleosomes being put together. Well, this uh, figure is a very nice figure. I like this figure a lot. It shows a developing embryo for a chicken. And this chicken had its DNA modified. The modification was they took the enhancer sequences for um, making muscles. So there were, there were enhancers that were involved in making muscles. And they put that in, those enhancers in front of the coding for beta-galactosidase. Well, beta-galactosidase, you remember, is the gene that can cut X-gal and give a blue color. So the question that they asked here was, where in a developing embryo are these muscle genes being expressed? And the answer was quite simple, because all they had to do was add X-gal and look to see where blue color appeared. And what they saw was really interesting, and it tells us something about the process of development. It tells us that we didn't see a light amount of blue spread all the way through here, so that it was roughly made almost everywhere. Instead, we saw very discrete patches in the developing embryo where those muscle cells were, in fact, being expressed. Okay? So what we're seeing is that sort of programming that happens during the process of development that gives rise later to cells that we know that have specific functions. I can't look at this and say, hey, that's going to be uh, a region that's maybe the muscle cell of a leg or an arm or something like that. But I can look at this and say, this definitely is where muscle cells are being expressed. So this would allow me, over time, to follow this region of the developing embryo and see, ultimately, what it became. So we can follow the process of development from the very earliest phases, where we can't recognize very much, ultimately into macroscopic structures like legs and arms and things like that, that we can see um, uh, happen as a result of the development that's occurred. OK. Now, um, I can't talk about transcription without talking about things that affect transcription. So the process is very, very complicated, as I said, in eukaryotic cells. And you've heard uh, the term epigenetics. And the term epigenetics relates to the fact that there are alterations that can happen to DNA or to the histones that bind to DNA that are transmitted from one cell to the next Okay? And they can affect one cell you know, or, or as a result of that, that uh, communication without affecting the DNA sequence itself. So we're seeing changes that are affecting cells 
that are being transmitted that don't affect DNA sequence. Well, one of those changes that can be transmitted you see on the screen is called methylation of cytosine. There's a methyl group that's been placed on this cytosine. And the effect of this methylation is to turn off transcription of genes near this cytosine. You had a question? Yeah, yeah. Do you mean transmitted means that during the cell division can be transmitted? So his question is, what does transmitted mean? And the answer is yes. During the process of cell division or of DNA duplication, this is duplicated as well. Yeah. So there are all kinds of epigenetics, and I'm not going to go through uh, epigenetic things that we know, but there are some really interesting things that people have uh, found with respect to epigenetics. So for example, if your grandmother smoked, okay, you're much more likely to have issues with weight. Okay? And that was something that had nothing to do with the sequence of your grandmother's DNA, but rather the fact that changes like this affected groups of genes, and that information got passed on down to you. Okay? Now, will those be there permanently? No. They do get changed over time. But your grandmother is close enough to you uh, in, um, um, in a time period that this change can carry over to you and affect you. Question? Well, this, is, this, this can be transmitted through gametes. Obviously, obviously, yes. Right. OK? OK, so pretty, pretty amazing stuff here. We've talked peripherally about how hormones can affect genes. We saw um, uh, examples, for ex example, where insulin was affecting the pathway. I'm sorry, not insulin. The epidermal growth factor was affecting uh, RAS. And RAS, I told you, could go and activate transcription and translation of genes related to the uh, proliferation of cells. There are also hormones that actually get into cells, not starting outside of cells, but actually get into cells and affect transcription as well. One of those, in fact, all uh, the, the group of those are known as the steroid hormones. The steroid hormones, by mechanisms that still aren't clear, can cross the cell membrane and get into cells and affect transcription. So here's one of those, estradiol, which you know is an estrogen. Okay? It turns out that there's a specific receptor for estradiol. It's called the estrogen receptor. It's called the nuclear, I'm sorry, it's called the nuclear hormone receptor. It's also called the estrogen receptor. All right? And I want to show you a little bit about how that works. Okay? I'll come back and say a word about retinoic acid in, in a bit. It turns out that the, that, the, um, receptor, that the nuclear hormone receptor has the ability to bind to estrogen and the ability to bind to DNA. And it turns out that these two things are in the same protein. However, they're not the same part of the protein. So the DNA binding region is separate from and independent of the estrogen binding component. Okay. Now, the binding of estrogen to the uh, uh, hormone does indeed affect the ability of the uh, hormone to act, but not its ability to bind to DNA. Now, this is a little puzzling. So this nuclear hormone receptor will bind to DNA whether or not the hormone is present. It's binding to DNA whether or not the hormone is present. I'm going to show you how it works in a second. All right? So this is going to bind to DNA whether or not the hormone is present. All right? Well, how does it work? The way it works is uh, as a result of what's called coactivator recruitment. Here we see on the left the DNA that has a sequence that's being recognized by the nuclear hormone receptor. We see two receptors binding to this sequence. And we see that they have a structure that looks like what you see here. They have an alpha helix that projects out, out into the uh, area away from the DNA. When the, when the estradiol comes along, it binds to the receptor. 
and it binds into this region here that, again, you see is independent of the DNA binding. However, it causes a structural change of those little thumbs that are sticking out there, such that instead of sticking outwards, they now bend down, as you can see here. What does that mean? It means that when they bend down, a new protein called a coactivator can bind. The coactivator cannot bind to the sequence on the left. Only when the estradiol has bound to the nuclear hormone receptor can the coactivator bind. Now the coactivator, as I will show you in a minute, is essential for stimulating transcription. Yes? So these uh, receptors for estrogen, they're all the signal DNA, right? If the sequence is available for them to bind to, it, they will bind to it. That's correct. So they don't just sleep because I'm wondering how it's all producing proteins right in the round nuclear zone. Okay, so his question is, it's, it's, it's the big question, which is, well, thinking about all these nucleosomes, how does this get in there? How does it do that? And that's a, a much bigger question than we're going to talk about here. But suffice it to say that even when it's wrapped with nucleosomes, this will have some access to binding that sequence. And we'll see why that's important in just a bit, because this coactivator is going to affect the nucleosomes. It's going to affect the nucleosomes. Okay. For right now, all I want you to keep in mind is the fact that the coactivator binds when the receptor is bound to estrogen or estradiol, and that the coactivator will play a role in the uh, transcription of this gene. Other questions before I, I, I jump, because I'm, I'm covering things kind of quickly here. Yeah. These are two proteins. They're a dimer. Okay, now, um, let's see, what else? Okay, I'll say one. So one of the drugs that's used to treat uh, um, uh, cancer is called tamoxifen. And tamoxifen binds to the estrogen receptor. Now, I mentioned to you earlier in class that some cancers are stimulated by estrogen. Some cancers are stimulated by estrogen. And one of the ways in which those cancers are treated is by using a drug, tamoxifen, or the related drug that you see over here. Tamoxifen will bind to the, est the, the nuclear hormone receptor and will stop its activation. That is, it will stop the coactivator from binding to it. Okay? Tamoxifen can block the action of estradiol on the nuclear hormone receptor. It's, what we, it's, it's an antagonist. It's binding and it's stopping the uh, nuclear hormone receptor from being able to, to bind to co, uh, the coactivator. All right, well, we're getting closer. Um, there, uh, you don't really need to see that. That was just the hormone, the receptor bound to tamoxifen. All right. Well, how do all these things come together? All right. Well, they come together in a very interesting way. First, I need to tell you about how histone, about how nucleosomes themselves are altered. We realize that that is a very complicated structure that DNA around with protein and the DNA wrapped proteins interacting with each other and uh, each other in bigger and bigger complexes. When they're very tightly wrapped up, it's very difficult for transcription to occur. So one of the things we want to do is we want to sort of unwrap those tight complexes so that the transcriptional machinery can get in and do its thing. Okay? One of the ways in which this happens is as a result of action of an enzyme called histone acetyl transferase. Histone acetyl transferase. So histone acetyl transferase is an enzyme. And this enzyme recognizes lysines inside of his, histones. And what it does is it takes those lysines and puts acetyl groups onto them. It's called acetylation. So acetylation of histones turns out to have a giant effect on them. The giant effect is that this lysine in this histone tail, which was negatively charged, now becomes neutrally charged. 
And remember that this positive charge of this tail was very important for its interaction of the histone with the DNA. We could imagine that this same histone, which has an acetyl group on it now, is not going to interact with the DNA nearly as tightly as it did before. And that's exactly what happens. So what we've done in acetylating this lysine residue of histones is we've loosened this tight structure that's holding together the DNA and histones into the nucleosome. We've loosened it. All right? Loosening it is a very important step in clearing out this space, excuse me, so transcription can happen. Okay? All right. The acetylation of lysine creates something called a bromo domain. A bromo domain is simply a lysine that's been acetylated. It's what a bromo domain is. It's a his, it's a it's a, uh, a lysine that has been acetylated. Okay. So these histones that have been acetylated now have bromo domains. The bromo domains themselves then are targets okay, for proteins that are at the transcriptional start site. So I'm going to step you through what's happening in the activation of a eukaryotic gene. All right? Here is that tight complex. The tight complex is the DNA very tightly wrapped around the histones. And the first thing that happens in the loosening up of that complex is the binding of a transcription factor. It might be at an enhancer sequence. It might be at the nuclear hormone receptor uh, sequence that it binds to. It doesn't really matter for our purposes right now. But an initial binding of something in some part of the DNA that allows access. Okay? You'll notice the way this is drawn is here's a nucleosome. Here's a nucleosome, here's a nucleosome, and here's a nucleosome. Between those nucleosomes is a relatively bare stretch, and we remember that, that those string part of the beads on the string is covered by a protein called H1. The H1 histone is there, and H1 histone will have some effect on the access of the transcription factors to the DNA that's there. Now, it's more complicated than we're going to go into here, but just keep in mind that there's H1s, and there are gaps between these individual nucleosomes. The transcription factor gets into that gap and binds. So in our case, this was the nuclear hormone receptor. The nuclear hormone receptor bound to estradiol and provided a place for the coactivator to bind. What did the coactivator do? Well, the coactivator takes and, and it, it is a histone acetylase. It puts acetyl groups onto lysines. So we see that this coactivator puts acetyls onto the lysines. The acetyls onto the lysines are targets for proteins that bind to bromodomains. And one of those is known as a remodeling engine. What's the remodeling engine doing? It's literally opening up this giant stretch of DNA so the transcription factors can get access to it. Okay? So now we see an exposed site as a result of action of the um, remodeling engine. And now this region can be transcribed. RNA polymerase can get in, can do its thing, and the gene can be, can be copied and made. Now, it's a lot of stuff. I'm going to slow down and stop and take questions there. Yes, sir? Good question. So what, what, stop, what starts or stops this thing from binding? Okay? It turns out that this space that we see right here, the spacing of these is critical. Because a space has to be open in order for the transcription factor to bind. Okay? There has to be what's called sequencing of these, that is regular spacing of these to allow this to open. It's not completely understood how this spacing is arranged. 
And if it's dynamic, that is, it may change over time. It probably does. So what is open right now might not have been open 15 minutes ago. But what caused it to open now when it wasn't open 15 minutes ago? Perhaps an environmental change. Perhaps the cell got slightly warmed. The proteins slightly changed shape, and the region opened up. Okay? So there's a wide variety of things that may affect that spacing. And we don't have to go into them here, but the point is that there are variations that allow access to transcription factors that can turn this whole business on. But you'll notice that we're going through a series of steps before we get to the RNA polymerase because making of this complex inside of eukaryotes requires a lot of space. And over here, this only requires one protein. So one protein can get in and do its thing where 15 or 20 proteins cannot. So the bottom line of this whole process is that the starting of transcription starts simply. There's a flag that's made by the acetylated lysines. This flag is recognized by a protein that clears everything out. And then the RNA polymerase comes in and transcription starts. So this is the sequence of events that's necessary for transcription to occur in eukaryotic cells. Yes, that's a lot of stuff. Yes, sir. How does the remodeling protein open up the nucleosomes? Again, it's, it's complicated, but it's using ATP energy to basically start peeling off and opening up this, this long strand. Yes? But just from mechanical point of view, you have several, uh, several uh, turns around the stone. Mm -hmm. If you pull it, I mean, I cannot imagine that actually it will just slide. Okay. The vision is a big deal. Yeah. Okay. So again, that's a, uh, the question is, how does, how does it pull off these proteins? That's a biophysical question that we're not going to have, have time to go into here. Remember that we have made, we put numerous acetyl groups onto the lysines so that the links between the proteins and DNA are not nearly as strong as they were before. So it's much easier. But it doesn't have to unwind it. It could, pull, it could, it could just kick them out physically. It could, yeah. yeah. I hear rustling. What's all the rustling about? We're not done. Maybe everybody's curious about this. Other questions? Should we finish it with a song? Song is a very easy one to sing. You guys like the Flintstones? You like the theme song from the Flintstones? Okay, I've got one called His Stones. His stones, tiny his stones, wrap up eukaryotic DNA. Using lysine side chains, they arrange a chromatin array. With them, DNAs of seven feet fit inside the nucleus so sweet. When you use the histones, you have to deal with condensation and its ablation inside your chromosome.